Okay, so welcome to lecture 13 of ECE 3311, Principles of Communication Systems. Um, today's lecture is the second part of our two-part series uh, regarding phase lock loops. Um, and uh, what are they, how are they used in, um, in a communication system? Uh, again, we're gonna be focusing on the analog world. Um, as we progress through this course, we will be dealing also with digital um, digital phase lock loops. But for now, we're looking at sort of the analog uh, uh, formulation of these, these, these uh, structures in communication systems. So what we talked about yesterday um, is a phase lock loop has the following structure. So let's, let's do this. Yeah, here we go. So phase lock loop, Nikes. There we go. Boop. So phase log loop has your input signal that you want to track. You have your phase detector, right? It produces V1, right? And that V1 is essentially a signal that uh, provides the phase difference between V in and some sort of reference signal. V naught of T. V naught of T is what your, your phase lock loop is producing in terms of saying, I think this is what your frequency and phase are matched to that of V in, right? And this is a very much a control theory type problem where it's like, this is your V naught and compares against V in. Oh, no, it's not. Okay, what's the difference? Oh, this is. And then recalculates, recalculates, recalculates until it hits some sort of steady state, which I'll, I'll describe in a second. What happens is the production of the V1, as we saw, is not perfect. There's going to be a lot of stuff in that resulting difference, uh, the resulting output of the phase detector between V in and V naught. So what we need is a loop filter, which is a low pass filter, and it's going to produce a signal V2 of T. So V2 of T essentially is a narrow band extract of V1, the information that we want, right? And now what we want to do is that V2, the voltage level is very important because that is the information uh, that contains that contains what the phase difference is or what the phase should be or the frequency should be. So what happens is we need to convert into, into a frequency, okay? Into some sort of oscillation. So, so what happens is it goes into something called a VCO or a voltage controlled oscillator. And so it produces the V naught. And the V naught is a periodic waveform, okay? And the periodicity, okay, is, is uh, uh, like uh, the value of the periodicity, the, that characteristic is completely determined by what V2 is equal to. Higher the voltage, you have um, a higher uh, uh, periodicity and lower, you get a lower one. And so what ha happens at the end of the day, we produce this voltage signal V naught of T. And that is what's gonna be used by your communication system in order to lock on to V in and progressively down convert it to a baseband signal, right? So this is how your phase lock loop works in, in a general form. Now, uh, in uh, like what we're gonna be doing today, okay? So in the last lecture, just to recap, we saw this structure. So this is from lecture 12, right? What we also saw from lecture 12 is we saw uh, the following structure, also from lecture 12. Is we have this representation and our phase detector is a combination of a product, correct? V naught of T, there's a gain term, KD. Here's that pesky low pass filter. We call it the loop filter, okay? And the loop filter, uh, is it two or one? I think, I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna put here F of F. That's a transfer function, okay? And the output here is the output here. Okay. 
the output here is v2 of t. Again, loop filter, uh, no, sorry, this is the VCO. The VCO is essentially an integrator from minus infinity all the way uh, to the current time instant, which if you have the Fourier transform of that, hmm, I forgot if it's V2 or V1, but, but essentially what integration is in the frequency domain, just like this transfer function here, is one over J2 pi of F, okay? That's integration. And that produces V naught of T, uh, v naught of T which also is the output, right? To address of the receiver, to R X. Right. We also saw, like when we, when we produce, when we try and write the expression of this thing, we tried to visualize it as some sort of system, right? So we wrote a differential equation from this. Okay. And this differential equation, uh, we simplified. We, we made some uh, approximations. Uh, in order to make it linear. So we linearize, linearized this, this expression in order to help us come up with um, a formulation that allows us to solve the phase lock loop, right? And we saw a few examples. And, and what we saw in lecture 12 was one example where we use Laplace transforms, okay? Uh, which is very, very popular in the uh, control theory because there, as opposed to communication theory, so when we do some sort of transformation from the time domain into the frequency domain, communication people are very, very happy with the imaginary part of the frequency domain. Uh, but for control folks, right? So, so when you do a Fourier transform, what's your frequency term? Well, it's J omega, right? Uh, in that transformation. In the control world, it's S, which is equal to sigma plus J omega. So they care also about that real, real component too. So, um, so from all of this, we, we, we had a formulation of differential equation, and then we progressed. And we, we came up with, um, with expressions at the same time, uh, frequency representations of the entire uh, sort of end to end what what uh what the communication system look like right we we choose one point uh in in the system so what happens is we reduce everything down into uh, frequency representation what we get at the end of the day is 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 um, a, a closed form expression that if we now know the components we'll be able to extract out what that transfer function of the entire phase lock loop is so in this lecture all right, in this lecture, in this lecture, what we'll do is we'll continue along that theme. And in particular, we'll be looking at one example, which is the FM or frequency modulation detector. All right, so what happened is we made some approximations. So just going back, okay, let's recap a little bit. So theta E of T, okay, that's the phase error. So we're making approximation here. Not sorry, not an approximation, but we're making a definition. We make the assumption that V in of T is equal to AI sine uh, Okay, so let's say we had omega, omega C of T, and then we had some sort of phase. And then we also had V naught, the reference signal. We have some constant amplitude, it doesn't really matter. This could be sine or cosine. It doesn't really matter, just like one's a 90 degrees phase offset from the other. So you just have to be care careful. Let's, let's just for sake of, and I forgot which one, I think this was cos, yeah, I don't know what's like. Uh, and this one has this guy, okay? So other than the 90 degrees phase shift, what was very important, okay? So as an aside, or note, or whichever one you want to refer to, call it as, um, it's not so much that, so if we look at these two, so first of all, this yields the error, the phase error between the two. Boop. So what we want, okay, is when we, we use the PLL, okay, 
the PLL, um, what we want at the end of the day is it's not really necessary that this thing has to go to zero. No, not really. Like, you know, we can, it would be, it would be great. But, but the thing is, we want this thing to ultimately converge to some sort of constant. Uh, don't you see Wiglinski? We want this to be equal to some sort of constant because that's fine. If we, so, so another way of looking at this um, over time, and let's say this is your PLL being executed, let's say from time equals zero, uh, and the vertical axis is your, what, what you may have is that. As long as your phase lock loop asymptotically reaches Asymptote. As long as your phase lock loop asymptotically reaches some sort of phase and stays there, this is when we know we've established a lock, right? And then what happens is the rest of the communication system compensates for that because it's very easy to say, oh, I'm going to rotate my phase back to zero later on in the communication chain. All we want to do is uh, avoid any sort of messiness in terms of phases jumping all over the place, right? So we had this formulation here, and we ultimately we have that, this expression for the phase error. Okay, so that guy here is the phase error. Okie dokie. So now, let's go back to our slides. All right. So if we evaluated like that phase lock loop, so this sucker here, this sign of the phase error, this guy here, you might say, where the heck is this coming from? Very easy. So this, this fellow here, um, if you apply, if you apply, uh, this is actually the sign business here. Remember it's sign, um, sign, uh, omega C T plus theta I T, right? Times cosine omega C T plus theta naught T, right? So this is going to produce a double frequency term, right? And it's also going to produce just the difference of, of theta I of T and theta naught of T that yields the phase error, right? Uh, we know that the low pass filter eliminates, eliminates the phase error. Um, uh, sorry, not the phrase error, the double frequency term. That's what this thing is. Now, so now what happens is when we feed in uh, this thing, like, you know, the, the, uh, we also, what we do is it's also convolving against F of T minus uh, lambda. So what this guy is, is this is convolution and we're convolving from zero to T. So we put in a dummy variable. Mm. Yes, that's correct. And these fellas here is also part of the formulation that we had, um, like a, the derivative of, of, of all these terms. So the, this is sort of the general expression of your phase lock loop. But we made an approximation, a very important approximation. We assume that the KD gain is very, very, very large. All right. And what that does, that actually does a fantastic thing. What it does is if KD Okay, that constant. So I described how in my structure here, this beautiful structure. Okay, if KD is very, very large, what this does is there's actually a number of things. So there's KD and also inside the VCO, I'm going to use a blue marker to, uh, there's also KV. So this, and this, you have complete control over, okay? You also have control over the low pass filter cutoff frequencies, okay? So when you, when all of you folks are gonna be designing your low pass filters, there's a couple of things that are gonna happen. So first of all, there's this initial value. What is the initial starting point? for uh, your loop filter. 
okay? You also have the KD value. You also have the KV value and you have the low pass filter cutoff. So you have four things that you can fiddle with that will either make or break your PLL. That's what makes PLL such a painful thing to work with because if you don't choose them right, you don't get, uh, where the heck is it? You don't get this. Right, you don't get lock. It's just gonna it's just gonna oscillate all over the place and blow up. All right. So going back, um, mew mew, boop, boop, boop. So we make this assumption here. KD is large, so we can make this approximation, right? So this is quite important. So because it, KD is large, we can make this approximation. And as a result, what we saw yesterday or lecture 12 in, in case you're not looking at this in, in sequential time, right? Is that you have the, this very, very important relationship between the theta naught, and this is the frequency domain representation, and theta i, and this is the incoming phase of your V in, right? And you get this beautiful relationship here. And f of f, remember, that's my loop filter transfer function. So you have KD, KV, F, and remember this guy here is the result of your integral, your integral expression uh, for the uh, VCO, your voltage controlled oscillator, all right? So let's just take another look at what this looks like. Yep, boop, boop. So what this looks like, okay? So what happens in the frequency domain with the phases? Well, it's not a multiplication, it's an addition. So super duper careful, right? Um, well, actually, no, I take that back, folks. Um, even if it was in a time domain, the phases are additive. Uh, in the, and if it's like the functions that contain the phases, well, that, uh, folks, is going to be um, uh, like a multiplicative of the functions, like, you know, the two signs and we have the tree identity. But with the approximation, with the KD being large and everything, uh, and everything becoming linearized, we get this. We get an addition rather than a product. So super duper heads up. Okay. If, if I spoke German uh, uh, fluently, I would say Achtung. <laughs> so then, uh, what what else gives? Okay. Um, oh, I, sorry. I just so uh, moo moo moo. I'm just losing track of things here. So now, uh, what happens is we have KD. This is the gain, right? F of F. This thing here is, as I said, is your, uh, what is an integral expression in the frequency domain? It's one over J two pi of F. And this here is your phase term there, right? And so what happens is your expression, right? This thing here, which is what I want. So this is, um, input, output relationship. Okay. So again, what you have to do is you have to start somewhere. So what do we know here? Well, this fellow here. So first of all, we know that, that it's going to be I. So what you do is you just progressively take step, steps back. So what is the value there? What is the value there? And then you know that that's going to be equal to that. And you start, you start playing around mathematically. And you get that expression that we had just a few seconds ago, which I'm like messing up on my... So it's going to be uh, the following. KV, KD, F of F over J two pi F plus F of F. And let's see if I'm missing anything. Oh yeah, same thing. KD, KV. Oh, yeah, Nikes. K 
KVKD. So this is very, very, very important. All right. So so we have that. So now uh, what happens is we can derive a lot of cool stuff. We can drive what the instantaneous. So what happens is I talked about hold in range, okay, and pull in, right? So we had this expression. Well, not expression, but we had this diagram, right? And uh, what happened is we had f of n. We had this f naught. F naught is the frequency of uh, of, of the V naught of T, which is what gets fed to the system. And we had these curves uh, that looked like this. Right? Yeah, and I'm trying to remember. Yep. Okay. So, so what happened is, um, depending on how we're traversing, so if we're traversing from a high frequency and we stumble upon F naught, right? So, uh, and then the other way around, okay? Um, and the vertical axis, axis, um, I am forgetting if it is, sorry folks, I'm just, because this is actually, this is, this is still, this is, to me is a fantastic diagram. Ah, here we go, B2 of T, that's what I thought. I, I, I'm like saying, nah, this is not B, B not of T. So what, what this guy is, ah, too confusing. I don't want folks to say, oh, green, no. Let us choose black, B2 of T. So first of all, again, B2 of T is what gets fed. This is input to BCO, right? So it's voltage, which is, uh, the, you know, the vertical here, right? Um, is what dictates what the oscillatory behavior of the output, which is going to be V naught, which then gets multiplied against your incoming signal what it looks like. So here, what we've got is this idea of hold in and pull in, right? So the idea that if you're traversing, let's say we look at the green, and as we get close to F naught, the VCO says, oh, 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 we're close to what, what should be the correct frequency that uh, corresponds to what the V not, uh, sorry, the, uh, the, the, the frequency of the input signal uh, uh, V in is, uh, get closer and closer and closer. Um, and then what happens is if we go too far, what happens is we try and pull in, we try and pull uh, like, uh, like we, we, or sorry, we, we hold in. So we pull in, pull in means we, we, um, uh, sorry, oh boy. Um, well, let's see. Yep, that's correct. So what happens is if we get close to the desired carrier frequency, what ends up happening is the, the, the VCO, uh, sorry, the input to the VCO, the, the uh, V2 uh, becomes a non-zero voltage. And it's like, yeah, 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 yeah. You want to get to F naught, F naught. So it's going to pull in the function, like that loop function, ultimately the characteristic, it's going to produce these V2 values that ultimately will try and converge to F0. If we overshoot, what will happen is the system is going to try and hold that voltage V2 such that we stay at F0. And the more we move to the right, that the, the system will try and fight, it will try and hold in uh, the V2 waveform at that frequency in order to bring it back to F naught, right? And then the exact opposite. If we're traversing from high frequency to low frequency, it's just reverse. So it's like bizarro world, right? So the pull in, once we get to within a specific range of F naught, it's like, oh yeah, yeah, you're close, you're close, you're close, you're close. 
and until v not uh, v2 becomes zero. And if we go too far, uh, the system will try and hold, pull pull in the 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 uh, no, sorry hold in uh, the v2 value. Okay, I know that, that it's so confusing. So what happens is if you get close. Right, so you're going in a specific direction and your V2 suddenly spikes up. What happens is your entire system will try and pull your V2 and increase your frequency until it reaches F0. Once you go overshoot or you hit F0 and you continue on your way and you over, begin overshooting F0, what ends up happening is that system will try and hold you back. It will try and hold you in to that F naught, okay? So pull in means you're close and the system pulls you into the F naught. If you overshoot and you begin moving away, uh, the system holds you back, okay? All right, I know, confusing. Hold in, pull in. <laughs> so what happens in all of this is you get this fella here. So what this is, the delta HF, uh, sorry, delta FH, this tells you for your phase lock loop based on your KV and your KD and what your transfer function of your loop filter is at zero. This gives you the hold-in range, right? So every hold-in range is different for phase lock loops, right? So remember, if like, you know, I, I mentioned before, I, sorry, let's go back here. This is actually pretty important. I remember stuff that you can modify that I was talking about. Mm. Yes. So initial starting point. So where your V naught starts, the value of your KD, the value of your KV, and the choice of cutoff filter for your LPF, all of these are critical. And that includes your hold-in range, as we just saw, okay? All righty. Okay, next step. So this is very important, this expression. So, um, so now we're gonna look at an example of an FM detector. So an FM waveform is almost like phase modulation. So remember, so let's go here. <laughs> so phase modulation. So, so remember there is AM, okay, amplitude modulation. So my passband signal is going to be equal to the real of AC, one plus my message signal. Okay, e to the j, two pi, f c of t, and what we got here. Okay, cool beans. All right, phase modulation. What we got here, some constant e to the j dp modulated. And we got, again, the modulation. And very importantly, what this guy looks like is going to be ac. Cosine 2 pi fc of t plus dp modulated signal, okay? So that's my phase term. Now, FM, almost the same, but AC, DF, integrate from minus infinity to T, uh, uh, M of tau, D tau, E to the J, two pi F C of T. And that is going to be equal to AC cos, and AC here is a constant, 
2 pi fc of t plus d of f, the integral from minus infinity to t, m of tau, d tau, close brackets. So the only difference between phase modulation and frequency modulation is that that phase term at the end, one is a phase, right? So m of t completely derives immediately what the phase is. In the case of the fm, it's the integral of that information signal that influences. So it's the running average, if you will. Uh, so from minus infinity to the current time instant, you're integrating across all of m of t. That value, the result of that instantaneous integration there, like of like all past values to that time instant, that is what is going to be equal to that term uh, where the phase should be for your, uh, for your FM signal. Okay. So now given that, Okay, you have this thing. So what do we know? What is the Fourier transform of this sucker? Well, it's gonna be equal to, remember integration in the frequency domain is one over J two pi of F. So that's what we get. So given all that, this is great. This is great. So what is uh, the relationship? So we want V2 of T, right? The output of the loop filter to be the demodulated message signal M of T. So is there a relationship? And the answer is absolutely yes, absolutely yes. So we gotta play around with some of the definitions here. So first of all, we let F not equal to the carrier frequency FC and that FC is within the capture range. So what I've just been talking about, hold in, pull in, all that jazz, we assume that we are well within that range. And then very importantly is we let KD uh, be very large in, in order to be within the, uh, like in order to model the capture range. All right. So, so what the, so how do we do this? So first of all, um, so we have this representation here. So we, first of all, um, what we have is, first of all, V, V2 of F is going to be equal to this expression here. Right. So, so you might say, okay, how did we get that? So we looked at this, right? We looked at, oops, sorry, one more. So we have this expression here, but we're gonna turn things around just ever so slightly. So what we do is again, like, so we have that relationship. Mm -hmm. Remember, so we have that. So you could do that. So, so plus sign or the sigma sign, it's all good. It just means, ah. Oh. <laughs> Loop filter, F of F. Okay, um, mu, mu, mu. Here's your VCO. And that's the thing there. So now what we're looking for, what, what are we trying to find? This is what we're trying to find, right? At that point. So specifically, uh, the specific, uh, what particularly we're trying to identify. Uh, what we're trying to find here is the V2 of F, right, from this model. V2 of F. So what happens is, okay, so we have this point here. Uh, what we what we want to do is, okay, what is V2 of F represented in this entire thing? Okay, so what we need to do is, okay, we have this guy here. Okay. All right. Um, what do we know? We have this guy here and we have this, this point here. So what we need to do is we just need to, again, sort of like work backwards how everything fits together. So, so if, we, if we do that in that expression, right? So we have V2 of F, we have this term here. 
what ends up happening is, and oh, yeah, shucks, we also have that thing there. So what we need to do is we just need to, to take this expression the other way. So this linearized expression, right? So, so, the, so the, how does this look like? So another way of looking at it. Well, what's a derivative? Derivative is j2 pi of f. So let's do that. So j2 pi of f. Okay, that's that thing there. Derivative is equal to j2 pi of f um, of i mu mu mu. Okay, um, and where is that? This here. Okay, minus what? And that is going to be. Uh, and then, and then, what ends up happening? So, uh, k d k v e convolved with f of t. And what's convolution in the frequency domain? It's product, right? So now what we need to do is we need to isolate. So what we could do is we could bring like all of this, like we could we can isolate for all of this um, expression. Hmm. No, I take that back. See, this is what happens when you do things on the fly. <laughs> All right, let my apologies, folks. Okay, let's. What you want to do is you want to you want to isolate stuff, right? So what what's going on here? So what you want to do is okay. So we know that v of f. What is this going to be equal to? It's going to be, uh, so this is going to be equal to, okay, uh, multiply by KD, okay, uh, equals, uh, and then it's going to be, okay, great. And now, uh, what is, what is um, uh, theta E going to be equal to? Well, theta e okay it's going to be equal to okay and so now we have that expression so the next step Hmm. There we go. So what do we know about this? Well, well, that's going to be equal to, ah, very helpful. That's going to be to the integral. Okay, cool beans. So now what we do, mm -hmm, minus j. So this is perfect. So now what we end up doing is we bring this term to the other side, okay? Isolate for V2 of F. And ultimately what we'll get is the expression that we have over here, this thing here, equation 11. So we could actually, let's maybe for, for the sake of completeness, let's actually solve it. So we end up getting, um, because I really don't want to mess up. So KD, so what do we get? Um, boop. So plus. Okay. 
Okay, very, very, very good. Okay, good, 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 good. KDFF. KD f of f is going to be equal to kd f f theta i okay kd f f perfect perfecto mundo yes so now um, now that we got that we keep that one plus mm -hmm. kd uh, sloppy ff is equal to that thing now we isolate kd ff FF, multiply top and bottom by the, uh, by by J two pi F FF theta IF and fingers crossed we get exactly what we should be me 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 and survey says yes. Thank, thank goodness. <laughs> uh, oh, oh, and then there's also, I think I forgot a constant. So just for the sake of completeness, where did Z constant go? So yeah, I, my mistake, folks. So I need to do KV, K, KV. Yeah, so what ends up happening is if we do that, so it's going to be KV, and we also have KD only here. Yeah, I already messed up there. Forgot that, but that's fine. That's fine. So we should get 1 over KV. KV, KD. And that should be equal to, yep, that's correct. Awesome sauce. And we can extract out this fella. So now we have an entire expression. This thing multiplied by theta i f, the phase of the input waveform. So cool. So now, now that we've got that, that's great. So now we have this relationship between the input and the output in terms of the phase and the frequency domain. So now that I have this, this is actually pretty important because now what I've got is because I have theta i of f. What's theta i of f again? Ah, I'm very sneaky. Theta i of f is equation 10. So if you replace equation 10 into equation 11, you got equation 12. So let's like let's just write it out. Okay, it helps. So let's let's do that again. So v2 of t. What is it equal to? Let's clean up let's clean up this show. So it's going to be j2 pi f over kv yep times f of f okay second guy okay and then this is plus f of f so instead of this, we know, what do we know? So according to the expression, that's from equation 10. That's going to be equal to df mm 
I'm sorry. What's what the heck is going on? D D sorry D F. Hmm. And this thing is what? M of F. Uh, capital, please. So this is actually really good. So if I plug that in, okay, and, and try and eliminate, like, uh, like what I have now is I have a direct relationship between the output V2 of T and M of T. So my FM detector from this structure, from this phase lock loop, I can get M of F. This is, this is a huge result. I don't show it. I'm a little bit tired, but, but this is actually really critical. So that DF is the constant that we have whenever we formulate the FM signal at the transmitter. Okay, so that's another constant that we have to deal with. But otherwise, if we um, execute and plug in M of F, okay, equation 10 into all of this, uh, we get this really beautiful relationship. And if we simplify things, right? So F is equal to F1 equals one. That's, that's huge, right? So where F, so, but, but very specifically, if this is an ideal filter that is band limited and the band is KV, KD over two pi. So that, and, and uh, our bandwidth is much less. It's, it's extremely narrow band. That's what this means. So this thing is extremely huge relative to B. So again, which makes sense, right? Because if we choose uh, KD to be extremely large, two pi is a constant and we have KV, okay? So what we end up getting is this beautiful relationship in 13. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do a couple of problems. Actually, I'm just gonna do one problem. And if time permits, maybe a second. But just to bring this home, Okay, so what I want to do, this is huge, huge, is what I want to do is I want to do equation. So that's the beautiful thing about the PLL. So, so first of all, the walk away. If there was a walk away from this lecture, using the PLL. So very happy. So what we're going to do is we're going to do an example. Uh, we're going to do from the class textbook equation 4.35. So 4.35, you get this like really kooky structure. And um, what ends up happening is it's a little bit weird. And you say, well, uh, how's that possible? I thought everything here already looks weird. Ah, oh, but it's even weirder than that, folks. So what we got is, okay, I got this. So far, I'm following. Mm-hmm, yep. Here's my loop filter. No problemo. There's my V2 of T. This, okay, that's what I want. I don't want um, theta naught of T. I want v, V2 of F. Uh, because that is what yields for me uh, the free uh, the, the FM information. The VCO is equal to this thing. And you'll see what the book the book is doing this thing. Now, you know what? I'm going to use a different color for that. The book is introducing to your standard structure this. You might say, what the heck is that? I'll show you in a second. So what the book is assuming is that you have some, what they call phase noise. It happens all the time in a communication system. So you got phase noise also injected into your communication system. And now what they like now you got to formulate everything with phase noise included. So what they want to figure out is the first thing is what's this relationship? 
the output phase versus the phase noise. Aye. So what is this? And um, to make life easy, they said, well, let's suppose that this thing is zero. There's like absolutely no phase, um, like or phase is at zero, okay, going in. So, okay, so let's do that. So uh, what happens is um, if we do that, uh, shucks. So let's do that here. So in fact, um, let's actually switch over to the to the solution. Okay. You might say, oh, really? Yeah. So this is actually available in the in Canvas, okay, for everybody. So you can check this out. This is actually pretty neat. Okay, so we have this model. So like, let's first see if everyone can see this. Okay. So what we have here is this representation. So what happens is if we eliminate uh, the input data, well, this is great. So now the only thing we really need to worry about is when the VCO is, is being employed. So first of all, uh, theta i is equal to zero. What's the Fourier transform of that? That's still zero. So whatever is produced by the summation goes directly into KD. It's almost like now the phase noise is the, is the input, the primary input uh, into your system. So we just got to derive accordingly given that, right? So now uh, if we have this, uh, uh, like we just do the same formulation as before, right? With the linearized model, um, so now we have this linearized model and we work out what the expression is. Well, first of all, we will know that the, uh, the, 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 out, the equation, right, for the theta naught, okay, is going to be equal to what? It's going to be equal to the uh, uh, theta two, right, uh, plus now, so the VCO, First of all, we want to separate out what theta naught is. So very importantly, what the VCO produces is not theta naught. Theta naught is whatever is going against your input uh, V in phase. So this is theta naught actually, and that's going to be equal to the summation of, let's say the output we describe as theta two and the phase noise theta n. So given that, we end up getting the following. Um, uh, we, we get this expression. Now, that expression, let's just go through the model. So theta two is equal to what? Theta two is equal to the cascade of two filters and theta naught plus a constant. So where the heck am I getting all of this? This is where I'm getting this all. Let's, I'm gonna draw the diagram and, 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 and explain, okay? So what, what we get is the following. So now with this, so uh, sorry, plus, plus, minus, That's equal to zero, so it doesn't matter. Not a pile of beans. <sighs> that goes there, right? Um, and that goes into here, and that's equal to KV, correct, right? So now, uh, very importantly, now we have all of these relationship thingies. So, Let's clean that up. K V J two pi F. Okay, cool. So now we got that. 
So, so what happens is we have this relationship. Um, I some, actually, they did not, uh, later on in the derivation, we replace it. So I'm already um, jumping ahead quite a few, quite a few steps, all right? Um, but what you do is you say, okay, uh, what, so this fella here is going directly if you, if you look at this thing, you see, say, okay, uh, theta two, okay, is gonna be equal to KB and J two pi F. Uh, it's gonna be multiplied by F of F. It's gonna be multiplied by KD. It's gonna be multiplied by theta naught of F, right? What's theta naught of F? Theta naught of F is equal to theta two of f plus theta n of f. So we can replace that by that expression. And the same rigmarole. Start isolating and then you can get as the expression you can ultimately get this type of input output expression between theta naught and theta n. So, um, so that's one way, right? So, so uh, one thing that would make sense is the problem is theta two, we don't know what theta two is, but we know what theta naught is. So here we have the relationship in terms of theta naught over theta n. So that's actually kind of important. So in this setup here, I used theta two as my starting point which is in hindsight, not the best place. So we actually want to start there. So same sort of thing. So we don't want that. How do you do that? Okay. And that's going to be equal to this fella plus this fella. And this fella, what is it going to be equal to? Well, it's going to be equal to kv over j2 pi f times f of f times kd times, oh, lo and behold, this. And we isolate for that, okay? And we'll get an expression in terms of this. If you, if you continue doing the isolation, that's what we want, okay? Ah, one thing I realized as I'm, I was chatting, so integration, okay? So the Fourier transform, okay? So Fourier transform of the integral, just wanna make sure. Because I, I think uh, inter integration, let me get my, um, my Fourier transform, <sighs> because I think, yeah, I think I goofed. So just a heads up, very, very, very important. And it is actually really important. So if I do, because I think I was doing this and I'm like saying, shucks, very, very important, keep track of this. So just in case um, I goofed, I want to emphasize this. Okay, see this? Fourier transform is one over J is over here. J is in the denominator, not the numerator. I, I just want to make sure because I think because of sloppiness, I've been putting in the numerator. Very important, it's in the denominator. Denominator. Otherwise, you're going to get the wrong answer, okay? It's going to be off by a sign. And then that's going to be uh, propagating all the way through. All right. So going through also the rest of the solution, you do that isolation, right? And so you'll get this expression. Uh, sorry, that, that previous expression. We don't have time for it, but there's an additional question here. We could probably start this in lecture 14. Um, but um, definitely, what is the walk away from, from lecture, from lecture um, 13? 
So we saw, again, uh, the PLL, and we used it in the all-important setup of using it as an FM detector, okay? So that's actually critically important because as an FM detector, we can do a lot of really cool things. If we have the PLL and we have an FM signal, it's like, oh shucks, I really wish I knew what the frequency was exactly. So for instance, if I did not know what my FM signal looks like. So for instance, in, in lab, sorry, in project uh, three, we're looking at decoding an actual FM radio signal, right, that was recorded. And what you'll see, and in ECE 4305, you'll see this all the time, okay, is when you have frequency offset. And this is a real world issue, okay? So here's your radio signal, and yet your receiver is designed for that, but your radio signal's over here, right? So you need some sort of way of automatically bring it over to alignment there because that's what your receiver has been optimized for. And this is where you use a PLL in order to bring it over because you don't want to do this manually all over and over and over again. All right. So other than that, I mean, uh, in terms of this lecture, I think we covered quite a bit. You're going to have to be, for both lecture 12 and lecture 13, very comfortable with being able to manipulate uh, these, uh, these um, you know, the PLLs uh, understand how it gets linearized. You don't have to derive it, but you should be familiar that there is a relationship between here's the exact expression and here's the approximation that becomes a linearized version of that and how to manipulate that in order to get transfer functions of the entire system. So you have an input and you have an output. All right, folks. So that is lecture 13 of ECE 3311 Principles of Communication Systems.